Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. Talk about them in a real way over the next few weeks. How many of you have ever seen that show Real World on TV? Anybody ever seen Real World? That is not the real world, okay? We're not, that, that's not the real world. We're going to share some real stuff this morning in the hope that it's going to help some people out. Parenthood, there's going to be something in this series really for everyone. And I want to challenge you today as some of these topics are going to be pretty deep and some of them build on one another that uh, really make it a priority to be here and not miss any of these messages over the next few weeks. It's imperative that we grow together, that we put some effort into our relationships because all of us in some way, shape, or form are part of a family. All of us have interpersonal relationships, and the things that we're going to be talking about are very important over the next few weeks, and I think God wants to do something very real and very special in our lives. What does real mean? It means true, fact, or genuine. Um, true fact or genuine. So today I've asked um, and gotten some permission from my family. Looks like they're all hiding now because they know I'm going to be talking about them. Um, I've gotten permission from my family to share some of the real life challenges that we faced over the years because we hope that our challenges in turn will help you. I'll be honest from the front. Today in particular is not especially scripturally intensive. We're going to be sharing some scriptures at the end, but our hope is that we lay the groundwork today by sharing sharing our story with you because sometimes our lives are a living epistle. Our lives give glory to God and what he's done in our life. And, you know, sometimes when you don't have the words to share, when you don't know the Bible good enough, you can just share your story and it's irrefutable evidence of what God has done in your life. And you're going to see some of that today. You're going to see it in our failings. You're going to see it in our successes. And I pray that it might help you. So can I be honest Marriages and families are generally messed up. Have you ever experienced that? How many of your families have issues? Come on, anybody didn't raise their hand? Come on, how many of you know? All of our families in some way, shape, or form have issues, you know? All of our marriages, in fact, have issues. You wanna know what the root cause of this is? Why do marriages have such challenges? It's because sinners say, I do. Let that sink in for just a moment. Sinners say, I do. You see, we go before the altar and we go on our wedding day and we listen to the words of the pastor and sometimes we gloss them over when they start talking to us about the two becoming one and about how we should live self-sacrificially and that these are the keys to marriage and we walk out from there. Um, What often is a very selfish act in and of itself when we have our weddings, right? We spend tens of thousands of dollars sometimes on our wedding day that we should have been spending on getting to know one another and counseling one another in advance, right? So that we could learn from one another. And then we walk out and we're in debt when we leave that day. I hope you didn't do this. Please say you didn't do this, right? But we put all this effort into that day. But guess what? There's a lot of work that surrounds in advance of that day and after that day. You know, you don't want to fall in love with somebody and go head over heels too quick and not get to know them. You know, there's a reason why you get to know people. Because people are a trip, and sometimes it takes a while to get to know them. That's why you shouldn't necessarily dive into things too quickly. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about? Right? Okay, so you're getting it. We're starting off. We're being real here today. It's going to go good. So we're sinners at the root of who we are. Sinners say, I do. Say, yeah, that's me. If they didn't say, that's me, neighbor, would you turn to them and would you say, that's you? Right? Because you know the person sitting next to you, you got issues. See, even when we're saved, if we're honest, we're still sinners. You see, I've been saved for 20 years, but I've still got a sin problem. I've got a selfishness problem. I've got challenges that I'm trying to crucify daily if I'm honest with myself. I can walk around and say I'm a super saint. You know, I'm a lot better in many regards than I was in terms of some of these defects of character 20 years ago, but I still deal with these kinds of things on a daily basis. I have selfishness issues that creep in where I want what I want when I want it. 
and I gotta sacrifice some of those things because if I wanna live and happy, joyous, and free in my relationship with Mary Jo and with my God, I can't be self-centered all the time. I've gotta release those things so at the root of many of our problems, if we're honest, is that we're selfish. We're selfish, that's who we are. See, this act of sinners coming together in our society has often been tragic. The divorce rate is over 50% for Christians and non-Christians. See, I think part of the challenge is we don't biblically understand what marriage and relationships are all about. So our divorce rate is the same as the world because we've been trained by the world and we've been trained by culture. There's times that we gotta set aside weeks like we're doing now and delve deeply into these kinds of topics so we can understand what biblical manhood is all about and what it means to be a godly woman and what it means to be in relationship with God and with others. We need to understand these things if we're ever to be successful in our marriages. Second and third marriages actually have a higher divorce rate than first marriages. So guess what? It is not greener on the other side of the fence. You might be looking, oh, he's so fine. His dirty laundry still stank, you know what I'm saying? You're still gonna have to clean it. It's like that. And it's worse in the second and third relationship oftentimes. People are remaining single longer than ever before. People are cohabitating more than ever before. Abortion rates are higher than ever before. Domestic abuse is way up there. People, let's be honest, families in our church are hurting. They're hurting. Last night, unbeknownst to even what the series was, there's a guy I walked into the lobby last night, and he's like, don't really want to be here. And I'm like, why? He goes, because I'm on the verge of divorce. It feels like all is hopeless. I said, you needed to be here. You're in the right place tonight. And afterwards, he came up and he said, you're right, man. God showed up. Thank you. There is hope found in this relationship with Jesus Christ. But marriages are struggling, and some of you might be here this morning, and you're on the verge of giving up. In fact, you dragged your husband or wife here on purpose because you heard they were talking about real marriage, and you said, if you don't get your butt up in here, I'm leaving you, right? It's okay. That's the starting point. God still is in the miracle-working business. Whatever brought you here, God brought you here for a reason so that you could hear what's being shared this morning. But too many of us are desperately hurting, and I think the least thing that I could do is step up here and say, here's 20 points to a happy marriage and happy relationships. You see, I've seen that preached oftentimes, many times in good settings where they're trying to do good things, but I think it does us a disservice when we're dealing with the real challenges of life. You know, I was at a pastor's conference not long ago, and a good-hearted pastor, I mean, he got up there, and he was sharing with a group of young pastors, and he said, okay, young guys, here's what you could do as pastors to secure your marriage and, and make sure you have a healthy one. You gotta go out and you gotta date your wife. Man, you gotta go out there and you gotta date her. I'm, Good thing, pretty cool, not bad. How many of you wanna date your husband and wife after you're married? Come on, anybody in here? All right. Some of you are like, I'm done with that already, come on. Okay, now when your daughter starts to get to the age where they reach puberty, what you gotta do is you gotta have this ceremony with them where you give them this ring and you give them this purity ring. And when you give them that purity ring, I'm telling you, when you instill that in them, everything's gonna be fine with your daughter. She's not gonna get pregnant. She's not gonna go after that wrong guy. She's just not, it's gonna be perfect. Everything's gonna be blissful and wonderful. Why are y'all laughing? Come on now. And your son when your son turns 13. You know those Jewish people, you know, they did these rites of passage as manhood. So you know what we gotta do when your son turns 13? You gotta do a knighting ceremony. I mean, you just gotta get him a sword and you gotta go out there and you gotta bless him and you gotta tell him what he's gonna do with his life and he's gonna grow up. These are all good things, right? They're good things. You should do some of those things. I, I make light of them, but you know, when the enemy has you as a target and he wants to take you and your family out, You could do every one of those 20 points, and guess what? You could still have difficulties and challenges in your marriage. You still could have very grave issues. See, how do you, as a Christian, deal with life when you seemingly have done everything right and you have a son or daughter who comes home addicted? They come home on drugs, and you try to help them, and they start to steal from you, and they start to you know, it, it challenge you and they start to act the fool and you have to go out there and you have to try to help them but you feel so helpless because they're out there and they're still using drugs and you don't know what you could do and you send them to treatment. You go there the first time and it doesn't work and they go again and it doesn't work and then maybe they're in jail, right? 
How do you deal with that? You've done all the right things as a Christian. This isn't supposed to happen in your family. How do you deal with that? Or how do you deal with it when a son or daughter, they come home pregnant one day, right? How do you deal with that? How do you, well, maybe the son couldn't come home pregnant, right? But that's all good. You know what I'm saying? They contribute to that problem, though. What do you do when you get a phone call that a loved one has been in an accident? What do you do? How do you deal with that? How do you console your wife when she's had a miscarriage? How do you deal with that? What if you get a phone call or a doctor's visit where your son or daughter will never live up to their full potential because they've got a grave mental disorder or that they've been injured and they might not live the life that you expected for them? How do you deal with that? That's real life, is it not? How do you deal with it when a family member or a loved one's been raped? How do you deal with that? What do you do with that as a Christian? Why don't we talk about those things? Why don't we talk about those challenges? Because those are the real issues that we're going through. How do you deal with your husband or your wife when they've lost their job? How are you gonna pay the bills when you're losing your house? These are the issues that our families are facing, and if we don't talk about them, how are we gonna help? How are we gonna ever start to defeat those statistics? How are we ever gonna live out a life that glorifies God even in the most difficult of circumstances? I'm here to tell you that you can do it, that God is still in control, that he loves you. And we're gonna learn more about that today and in the weeks ahead. But before we get into it, I wanna share with you a couple truths that we need to know right from the beginning. The devil is out to destroy you and your family. You have to understand that. When you became a Christian and even beforehand, you were actually involved in this cosmic war, war that's going on in the world. The devil wants to defeat you and see, before you were a Christian, he didn't have to mess with you that much because you were kind of already on his team and you didn't even know it. So he just let you go about your happy business and do the things that you would do because you were already out there living for him unbeknownst to yourself. But the day that you became a Christian, you and your marriage, if you're married, has become a target because now he knows that your marriage, if living out healthily, will accurately reflect the image and glory of God. And he hates God, and he hates it when he sees accurate reflections of the image and glory of God. See, when the two become one in relationship and God is at the center, it reflects the Trinitarian nature of God. So when we're living with God first and we're in love with one another, it expresses that image to the outward world, and it's a reflection of God's glory. And he's going to do whatever he can to destroy that. Men, you know what that means? If your ideal woman is walking down the road, right, your ideal figure in your mind of what that woman will be, all of a sudden there's going to be a low moment in your day and that woman is going to walk by you. And she's going to be wearing scantily clad clothing just to entice you and she is the devil in disguise. Woman, that vision that you have of that knight in shining armor, 